In our last video, we shared why we changed our mind about our old new boat and how we got here. Today, we want to share what we're learning about the trade-offs when deciding on a performance catamaran for liveaboard cruising. Not too long ago, cruisers started moving from monohulls to catamarans. And in recent years, people have also been moving from production boats to performance boats. So we're definitely not alone. And everybody has different opinions. Everybody has different preferences. Everybody has different criteria. But we just want to share with you what we've learned about performance and what it really means. Automatically, I mean, we tend to associate performance with speed and racing, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's more about the physics of the boat. So a true performance design catamaran with long, narrow hulls, with dagger boards, a lightweight boat, the weight centered in the middle, all these characteristics offer some truly compelling benefits to, to cruisers like us. That's right. And it kind of just comes down to the math. And so once we discovered this, we started cheating on our boat, which I felt <laughs> kind of bad about because we would be on our boat and I'd be like looking through, you know, on the internet at all these different things about performance cats. Mm -hmm. But uh, we definitely learned a lot. We headed over to Utamir to talk to their head of engineering. We wanted to understand what defines a performance catamaran and what live aboard should be thinking about. What I want to talk to you about today is what makes a performance boat? Well, if I had one sentence I think to say is a performance boat is a boat that sails. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty simple, <laughs> but I think that the main thing, before saying how we achieve it, what we want to achieve when we say we are designing and, and building performance boats, we want to build boats that are going to spend uh, a large part of their time at sea under sail. Versus motoring. Versus motoring. Basically performance, as you said, is, is not about racing. We, we might have done it a few times, but that's not our main, our main target. Um, when you sail on board, on board a performance boat, uh, first of all, as we said, you're going to sail a lot, which means that the big thing is that you're going to start sailing under sails uh, very early on, so as Pretty much as soon as you've got five knots wind, you can hoist and, and switch off the engine. And that's that's one that's of the amazing. Main, that's amazing. Yeah. That's the really the main factor and something that we refuse, absolutely refuse to uh, compromise on. And uh, so sailing uh, as soon as possible is the main thing. And, uh, and then sailing fast, yes, it is also something that uh, sailing fast is what lets you um, choose a little bit more your weather forecast. Um, if, you, if you can go ahead of, the, ahead of the system that you're surrounded by uh, and, and plan ahead and position yourself in the system you want, uh, you will avoid the place where you don't want to be. Uh, the fact of sailing fast is what makes you spend the best part of your time doing what you really like doing. Obviously everyone likes sailing, but I think everyone planning on a two weeks passage would be super happy to have two weeks minus two days. Yeah, and for I can, sure. I yeah. think we all enjoy the, the, the parties, the dinners, finding families and friends back when you mm -hmm. arrive ashore. And, uh, and, and on the performance boat, you're going to get to that part quicker. You're going to see more if you, if you go for a two month, six month, two years uh, trip you're obviously going to see more if you go fast and mm -hmm. you're going to spend more time looking at what you want to be looking at rather than spending time at sea mm -hmm. or where you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. So, so that, th those are the main goal, I think, like uh, choosing your systems, your, your weather systems, uh, uh, spending time doing what you actually like best doing. When we draw boats, uh, as much as we like uh, drawing pretty lines, the drawing of a boat starts from numbers. Like the first thing we draw is actually a spreadsheet with a lot of numbers and parameters of the boat. 
because as you said, parameters, uh, there are plenty of parameters that affect the performance. Uh -huh. um, so the speed of a, of a hull, of a canoe body, uh, is uh, directly linked to its length, that's a fact. So a longer boat, a longer waterline, because a boat can, can have huge overhangs and don't not go faster than a, than a smaller one. Um, it's the, the submerged surface of the hull, length of the hull, that is, um, that's having an impact on the maximum speed of the boat. That's the length waterline. So okay. that's length waterline is really a, a big factor for the hull. So for um, length overall of a boat of 20 meter, the best boat you can do within those 20 meters is the length waterline of 20 meters. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to try to optimize the length waterline uh, versus the length of a road. Then you've got, uh, indeed you said it, you've got the weight. The weight is one of the major uh, points uh, for performance because it's pretty easy to, to see and to, to judge even a shore. Moving a weight which is heavier is going to require more power. Um, so the lighter you make your boat and the faster it will go. That's quite simple to understand. However, you've got also the power of the boat. And in, in, uh, when we talk about catamaran, the power is proportional to two factors, the weight and the displacement. And that's when it starts being a bit tricky because on one side we say um, your, your boat needs to be light to move fast, but you also need power from your sails and from your structure, from the geometry of your boat and the power is linked to the weight proportionally. So if you increase weight, you increase power, and you, so you increase uh, um, forward motion. So there is a little, a little tricky bit there where you want the light boat, you want a light boat, um, um, but it doesn't mean that the weight is uh, useless. Simple for anyone who's ever jumped on board a, 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 a light catamaran, like a hobby cat, for instance. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Pretty. Everyone who's done that <laughs> will, will, will see what I mean. Um, if you're 50 kilo, you go on board a hobby 16 in 15 knots of wind. You're quite likely to p go up on a hull very quickly and probably to capsize. We did that. <laughs> you do that. Um, Invite two, two friends with you, uh, 80 kilos each. You're going to struggle getting that hull to lift off the water and you're most likely not going to capsize. Uh, so you say, hold on, I was light and I ended up upside down and I, I could not accelerate because the boat was coming up very quickly. But then, so I've put more weight, which I've been told before was not good. And actually I was more powerful. And that's, the, that's the, the compromise that we need to find in our ways on the catamaran. Yes, we need a light boat, but the weight is useful for the power. But we said the power is two factors, weight and geometry. In the case of a catamaran, it's made principally the width of the boats mm -hmm. that's going to make that, that power. So it's a couple between weight and uh, so displacement and, uh, and uh, space between each hull, between the two hull, that's going to make that power. We call it the writing moment. Hmm. So length, big factor, a bigger boat is going to go faster. Uh, weight, we need a light boat to, to be able to get it to move uh, easily with little power and that's mostly important in the light winds. Uh, and then geometry, uh, the wider the boat is going to be for same weight, the wider the boat is going to be and the more power you're going to get. But relation between weight and geometry of the boats, especially the width of the boat, which is going to create that, that couple and therefore the power and therefore the performance. So as we were doing our research and we were also out cruising and we were meeting, coincidentally, mm -hmm. a lot of Outremer owners and we started comparing notes and what they were experiencing and what we were experiencing was completely different. Not just when it came to how the boat behaved and kind of the joy of sailing that we were talking about, 
but also in really important things like, you know, warranty and support and stuff like that. Yeah, so we came to La Grande Mart to do a test sale and we sell two days on an Outremer 51. It happened to also be Outremer week. And so that's where a lot of future Outremer owners are. But also there was uh, a lot of existing Outremer owners that were in La Grande Mart ready to go on a three year circumnavigation. So it was super interesting to talk to them because some of them had their boats for already a couple of years. So uh, all that experience over a week and really, really validated, uh, confirm our expectations basically about Outremer and about the boat. Right, and for us making this kind of change it was a pretty big threshold because yeah. we had just spent two seasons getting the boat ready. So when our production boat came out of the factory, there was so much left to do on it to get it you know, set up so that the two of us could actually operate it safely on a circumnavigation. So it had to make a difference. Mm. And you know, while the new boat that they were talking to us about was really, really cool, it came down to all of the other things around actually the company. So the main reasons we decided to go with the Tom Air was their, um, their reputation. They, they have a very solid reputation for building performance catamarans for people who want to sail around the world. Also for the, uh, the boat building quality. Uh, those boats are built to last over for 50 years and to go around the world multiple times. Which means really good resale value. I mean, you know, that's why you can't find one used. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a big bonus. It definitely is, and um, and also their philosophy. Um, they are not just trying to sell you a boat. They are really truly trying to help you with your project, and um, and so it's it just goes beyond of uh, of a pure uh, business transaction. Right. I mean, it's what's cool is like whenever someone at Utremer asks you like what's going on they ask you what's your project they don't like talk like the boat stuff you know they're really interested in in where you're headed and we actually had a chance to sit down with the ceo mm -hmm. of um grand large yachting who owns utremer and gunboat and the other boats and talk to them about this and um, you know they really look at the big picture and want to help everybody really be successful and um, make sure that they're trained and ready to go and know how to properly operate the boat what, what was truly important to us is that we could work directly with Utremer. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, with our last production boat, the warranty and support process was kind of this black box. It was like mm. a big mystery that we had to kind of go unravel and figure out and was never really well explained. Um, I don't know if that was on purpose or what, mm -hmm. but um, here we can have direct access to the service and support teams. We've met them mm -hmm. and we understand the process and um, you know that's a real benefit. Yeah. Another important benefit is that uh, when the boat is going to be handed over to us, the boat is going to be ready to sail across the Atlantic um, after a shakedown, of course, and going back to mm -hmm. like one month to go through the punch list. But there won't be any major projects, uh, any major refits to do later. Um, the boat will come out with uh, lithium batteries. Uh, it will have like induction in the galley. Um, so no major projects to plan along the way. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, they have, you know, a really great owner's community. They have events and all of that, which is great. Um, but the other thing is they have a really um, interesting program for ladies only. Uh, there's mixed emotions people have about ladies only types of programs, but I definitely think it's great and it's a huge benefit to help women build confidence, um, you know, to help their husbands on the boat and that sort of thing. Um, certainly there are women who are the skippers and the men need to work on their skills too. Um, but there's definitely dynamics on the boat. Uh, you know, if, if one person just doesn't have an opportunity to learn and someone's farther along. So I think that's a really important way that they're looking at that to give spouses a chance to do that. Yeah. And another event that they started a year ago is to a three year circumnavigation. So for people who have a, a three year plan, and who might want a little bit of support and less headaches with administratives and more support about technical uh, stuff. Um, it's really a great way to, uh, uh, to sail around the world. And to meet people. Yeah.
make friends for life. Yeah. And I forgot to mention um, their training programs that they have during Otomer Week. It also includes things like safety and medical and weather and electrical and diesel, which are all classes we were trying to sign up for and kind of piecemeal together ourselves. And it was mm -hmm. actually really hard. Yeah. So they really simplified the logistics to get up to speed on all the skills that you need. In a short period of time. And finally is value. Mm -hmm. When you look at all the prices for similar sized boats and you consider everything that goes along with buying a Nutramere, we just felt like it was a better overall value. So that combined with everything else just made us feel like Nutramere was the right company to be working with. Let's break this down. There were four things to consider in finding the right boat. A boat that could maintain performance with three tons of stuff on board. The base price of the boat, just ballpark and whether or not it was in our budget, the overall design, inside and outside, and finally, value, vendor reputation, and service and support. First, performance. We took the basic equation for performance, which is cell area or power by displacement against the length of the water line. We want a manageable size boat for two people that has all the benefits of a performance boat while still carrying all the stuff we'll put on it. Based on our needs, we expect that to be about three tons, which requires at least 50 feet of length. There are great boats that are shorter. Even the 045, which is technically 48 feet in an attempt to allow just a bit more weight to be put on the boat. It's hard to believe, but all the tiny stuff adds up even when you're trying to live light. We did a recent podcast on living light that you can also check out. And that shook out a couple of options. Next was price range, which puts you in two basic categories, super expensive and eye-watering. But we had to rule out a couple of boats that were way beyond anything we were ever gonna pay. A quick note on dagger boards. We believe they're a key feature for a light displacement boat like this, especially for circumnavigation. We wanna be able to sail upwind if we need to and get the grip when necessary. For the HH50OC, which is listed here, we would need to get the dagger board option, which would also be extra beyond the base price. Then we looked at overall design. Of course, there were some we loved, both of which were in the higher price category. We were mixed on the balance and the Otremer 51, and neither of us could connect with the sea wind compared to the others. For overall value, that includes all you get for the price, plus the vendor reputation, service, and support. The Utremer here for us ranked very high, narrowing the list. While the HHOC50 rated high, if we're gonna go in that direction on price, given what we know about Utremer as a vendor, and looking at the O55 performance versus the HH50 performance, we would just go for the O55. So this is where we landed. This is a big purchase, so we reserve the right to be picky, but we also recognize these are good dilemmas to have. The O51 just didn't feel like a modern live aboard boat. It felt like a sailboat built for serious sailors, but lacked the features that address the liveaboard factor. Stefan loved it, but I couldn't really connect to it. The O55, by anyone's standards, is a dream boat. It's also very big and very expensive, just too much for us. While four feet doesn't seem like that much difference compared to the 51, when you get on it, it feels like twice the size and was really intimidating for me as I was thinking about trying to manage this boat with only two of us. Other people don't feel this way, but for us, it was just too big. So that's what prompted us reaching out to Utamir, asking them if anything else was on the dock, so to say. We wanted to know if they were going to take any of the improvements from the O55 and apply it to the 51. And that's when they invited us to come out and talk to them. Yes. So we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff regarding performance boats, mm -hmm. but we hope that you take something useful away from this video so that if you're talking to other manufacturers, you are armed with the information that we've been able to learn. So make sure you stay tuned because in the next video, we get to announce our new boat. The big reveal. It's really exciting. We hope you stick around for our next video and be sure to check out our last video where we share our full story. For all the juicy details, those can be found on our Covert Castaway podcast if listening is your thing. Fair winds for now.